Hi everybody and welcome back to lecture 3 MOSFET modeling. We now move on to the chapter called Threshold Voltage Revisited. Okay, but before we start I want to remind you about energy band diagrams that you probably learned about in some sort of semiconductor physics course. So um, we have to look at these diagrams and usually we um, look at the semiconductor device uh, at, the, um, at the MOSFET kind of on its side. So if we usually would take our MOSFET in this course, which would be something like this. Um, we're going to turn it over on its side, so now we're looking at, the, at it this way. So this is the source drain and gate, and now we're looking at it like this, where we have the, uh, the gate, the, the oxide, and the substrate. So this is going to be the gate, or the M, this is going to be the oxide, or the O, and this is going to be the substrate, or the semiconductor. Um, over here. Okay, so we're looking at it in this direction. And when we draw the, the energy diagrams, we can, the energy band diagrams, we can see that we have the energy bands, uh, which are the Fermi voltage, the conductance band, the valence band of the, um, uh, of the conducting gate. We have the potential barrier of the oxide, which is this part over here. And we have the, uh, the energy band diagrams of the substrate. And um, uh, that's what we can see over at this uh, area over here. Okay, um, the second approach though we can take is actually looking in the source to the drain. So we can take our MOSFET as we usually look at it where we have again the source, the drain, and the gate over here. And um, we, can, we can look at it in that way. And what we see here is that the, uh, at flat band when we haven't put any voltage on the gate, we have um, some sort of energy at the source. We have this large potential barrier over here at the gate. And we have the drain which is at a higher voltage that causes um, the energy uh, bands to go lower. Now this um, big energy, uh, this big uh, potential barrier over here is what makes the electrons that are on this side not be able to cross over and that's why we don't have any conduction in, uh, in, a, in this case where VGS is zero. On the other hand, once we uh, apply voltage and we get into inversion, one other way of looking at inversion um, is to say, say that our potential barrier goes way down. So VGS now is going to become some sort of a VT of a long channel transistor in this case. And um, it's going to take our potential barrier over here to only be 0.2 electron volts difference from the energy of the source. And when the, uh, the potential barrier is so low, the electrons can go easily and uh, cross over from the source to the drain. And then as long as we have a voltage uh, a voltage difference between the source and the drain, we can have um, conduction. So that's another way to look at the energy band diagrams. Okay, remembering that we can go over to the, to the basic theory of threshold voltage, which uh, we have learned in the semiconductor physics course. And um, what actually the basic definition of threshold voltage is the gate voltage, VG, that's the voltage that we apply to the gate of the uh, of the semiconductor device of the MOSFET that's required to invert the channel. And inverting the channel means that we're going to take uh, a um, uh, a p-type device. So the channel over here is p-type. And once we apply such a, a voltage of VT, we're going to actually change the channel so it looks like a, a um, uh, an n-type device. So basically, our Fermi uh, band here is close to the valence. Um, band uh, deep inside the the substrate because it's p-type over here um, and if we look though at the channel area our Fermi level is actually closer to the conduction band and uh, the difference the, that it made the change that it made from uh, the distance it was over here between uh, between the valence band uh, uh, on this side of the um, uh, middle of the bands and on this side is the same. So uh, that's actually the Fermi uh, potential, phi Fermi. And we have to actually change, make this bending of the bands that's two phi Fermi to invert the channel. In other words, we turn the uh, p-type substrate, which was over here at the channel, we basically got rid of the uh, holes that were over there and brought in electrons and turned it into an n-type, which is um, doped at the same amount that the substrate was before. That's what we call inversion. Um, we wrote this out as a, uh, a as a type of expression for this um, VT, for this threshold voltage, which is a function of the um, uh, the work function between the metal and the substrate or the gate and the substrate uh, minus this two phi for me which is again this potential drop that we want to bend the bands here okay minus the uh, the volt the voltage that falls on the oxide because of different uh, 
uh, charge that will be stuck inside the oxide. Okay, that's Q ox over C ox. The Q depletion over C ox, that's the charge that was inside the substrate that we had to push away. That's the uh, basically the charge of the um, def depletion uh, area over here and depletion region underneath on the substrate side and the implant that we, we uh, drove into the channel. So if you remember, we made a VT implant as well. Okay, so that's our VT. Um, uh, Q depletion over here is uh, structured in this way and uh, fee the Fermi voltage is uh, the thermal voltage LAN uh, of the, uh, of the um, uh, doping and the uh, and the thermal voltage is kT over Q, and this brings our um, our dependence on temperature in the in the threshold voltage. So that was kind of our expression for threshold voltage that we um, that we realized in a semiconductor physics at a first level, um, and that's what we kind of used in a basic circuits course to define our VT. But we have different effects that actually change VT and see that it's not this constant um, this constant number that was set by the fab, but it's something that actually depends on our bias or our operating point. So the first thing is the body effect. And um, what we see is that uh, when we have some sort of a voltage drop between the source and the body, a VSB, which is different than zero, then we get a change in VT. So as you can see here, there's this VBS over here, and this is plotting VT, and we see that it's not constant. There is a dependence of VT on the voltage between the body and uh, in between this body and this source. So if these are not uh, uh, equal to each other, then we get a change in the VT of the transistor. And why does this happen? Basically, it makes more charge or less charge or harder to deplete the transistor, which means we have to put on more or less voltage on the gate to actually reach this depletion and then cause inversion in the channel. So we can change uh, the our previous um, uh, expression by uh, putting this uh, dependence on uh, VSB into the, the expression for Q depletion for the depletion charge in this way. So here we have this VSB and plugging that back in, we can get VT, which is the VT zero. That's the, the, um, the expression we had before without the uh, VSB type of factor um, with this, uh, this coefficient, this uh, body effect coefficient times um, this expression, which has VSB in it. Okay. Um, again, here is our VT zero that we had before. Um, we also have the Q implant over there that I just took off here, and this is the definition of this uh, gamma. So that's uh, our classic body effect. It's kind of hard to work with, but uh, actually we can look at it differently. So a different uh, approach is to look at the capacitive voltage divider that's between the gate and the body. Okay, so what we see here is that um, our gate to our channel has this, uh, this uh, C aux, this type of a uh, of a capacitance and what we actually want to do in a transistor is we want to have this nice uh, transfer function that whatever we put on our gate changes our voltage at the channel to invert it and to cause uh, cause uh, it to have a larger channel or a smaller channel however we have other capacitances that are running around inside our inside our device for example we have this capacitance that is the uh, the depletion capacitance of the of, uh, inside the substrate and that's actually bothering us because um, this is connected to VB over here so VB is this uh, bottom uh, node over here of uh, this capacitor and it's actually fighting with uh, the the gate in, in um, controlling what happens in the channel and that's something that we don't want because our device is supposed to be a switch where we do everything from the gate uh, voltage but we actually have this other um, at least one because we have different uh, capacitances but this is the strongest one we have another node that actually has some control over um, the channel okay so we can draw that out over here in, in kind of a, a circuit that we have our um, gate voltage over here our body voltage over here and our source voltage over here and uh, uh, what we have is this voltage divider between that goes over the C ox E and the C dep, the depletion capacitance and the oxide capacitance. Um, the depletion capacitance is some sort of a uh, um, uh, epsilon of the of the substrate divided by the maximum depletion width. Okay. Um, when we plug that back in, we can uh, write a um, write a an expression for the charge that uh, is required for inversion, and we get again the voltage. Uh, which is VGS minus VT, which is the inversion voltage, uh, minus the uh, voltage over here that falls on 
um, this top capacitor times the, the this capacitance itself plus the voltage over here which is uh, uh, this is VSB plus VCS times the depletion charge and we can rewrite that a little bit um, bring over um, a, a new uh, very, a new parameter called n where n is defined as one plus the depletion uh, over the oxide uh, capacitance so this uh, the ratio between this and this okay and essentially what we would want is our oxide capacitance to be very big and our depletion capacitance to be very small and in that case this is zero okay but it's not really small and if we actually uh, take the the numbers over here of the epsilon s um, and plug it in and what our depletion capacitance is uh, the epsilon s over epsilon ox what we get is that this is three times the thickness of the oxide uh, divided by the maximum depletion capacitance uh, pretty much in a modern uh, technology okay um, but again what we want is this to be big and this to be small so we want this whole thing to actually be um, zero and the actually if we had only an oxide capacitance and no depletion capacitance our maximum n or our, our optimal n would be one anything over one is not good in fact, many of the transistors that we were, we're building today and we'll discuss later on in the course are trying to improve this N so it becomes 1. Okay, so when we, we can redefine VT in that way, we can say that VT is actually some sort of a... Uh, um, some sort of different type of a of an expression where we take the vt zero this this general uh, vt that we had and then we see that there's this voltage divider between the depletion and the oxide uh, times vsb and um, uh, in modern technologies this is a constant so we get uh, linear dependence on uh, vsb so instead of our graph that we had before we now have some sort of a linear dependence um, for vt on vsb Beforehand, it wasn't very linear. It was kind of a strange uh, um, type of thing. Um, I would also want to point out that from uh, 90 nanometers and below or so, the body effect is actually pretty small, and um, we it, it doesn't affect us as much. Uh, and at FinFed and so forth, it, it's actually much smaller and is much, uh, much a lesser effect. Okay, so again, that was the first basic um, uh, phenomena that uh, changes our VT from being the, what the fab provided us as the VT0, um, but we have other things. For example, polydepletion and channel depth, okay? So um, there, these are two uh, additional factors that we never discussed, but remember that our um, gate, it used to be at least uh, polysilicon, and polysilicon is another type of a semiconductor, and therefore it also has depletion in it. So when we apply a voltage to um, the polysilicon, even though it acts a lot like a conductor, it still is a semiconductor and the, bolt and the bands still bend, and that means that we have some charge accumulating inside the uh, poly itself, and what that does is it effectively makes the um, thickness of the oxide larger than um, from being just the actual thickness from the uh, surface of the oxide, uh, the interface of the oxide with the substrate and the interface of the oxide with the polysilicon. It actually effectively becomes a bit um, larger than that. That's uh, the number one thing. The other thing is the channel depth. If we look at our semi, if we look at our um, MOSFET, okay, um, we assume that all of the all of the uh, uh, current is right here at, um, at right on along the interface, but it's actually not. It's deeper down. We have um, we have our uh, uh, carriers scattered around, and somewhere in the middle is our effective. Uh, um, uh, current and so we get this extra additional kind of a depth so that's the the charge over here is like the additional depth we have on the substrate side so in total we get a much larger um, thickness so our, our thickness our t ox e is actually the t ox plus the t poly plus the t channel or something like that and so it comes out much larger. And again, we want our T-ox to be as small as possible because remember that C-ox equals uh, E-ox over T-ox. Well, it's not. It's T-ox E. And the larger it is, it means the smaller the C-ox is. And we um, hurt our voltage divider again 
that we had there that we wanted this to be as large as possible, this C ox E. Okay, and um, again, the, the larger the T ox is, the smaller this gets, and then the more control we have through the depletion uh, capacitance, which is what we don't want. Okay, and again, remember, so, so again, what we want is we want this to be as large as possible, but unfortunately, because of things like poly depletion and channel depth, uh, um, we actually get this to go down, which means that um, our N comes farther away from 1. Okay, the next um, phenomena I want to discuss is kind of a different type of phenomena. It's a reliability phenomena, and we, it's uh, called hot carrier effect. So electrons uh, are running through the channel. They're running from the source to the drain, and they're running uh, very fast. And once they hit the, the depletion uh, region of the drain, they actually um, get pulled in the electric field. And uh, these electrons, again, they're going very fast. They have a, a large field on them, which means they are getting hot. They are have a lot of energy. On the other hand, we're also putting a voltage on the gate. And this voltage is causing um, a pull uh, in this direction, on the in the vertical direction on these electrons. And since the electrons are so hot, they have so much energy, there is a, um, there, there's a, a good chance, uh, some sort of non-zero um, probability that they will jump over this uh, potential barrier of the oxide. And in fact, they may not jump the whole way and coming from the channel to the gate, but they may get stuck in some position that's inside the oxide over here. And if uh, an electron gets stuck inside the oxide, it actually adds to this Q ox and uh, makes it a, a larger quantity. Um, what that does is it increases the threshold voltage over time. Okay, this is a reliability problem. So the, the more we use the transistor, the more we're um, sending current through the uh, transistor um, with a large uh, VDS, um, more, more and more currents going in, there's going a larger probability that we're gonna have these uh, um, these charge the, this charge get trapped inside the oxide and change our uh, our VT and we can see in this uh, pretty old graph that we had our original um, our original threshold voltage or our original current through the transistor over here and after a while it, it, it got smaller and that's going to affect actually how our device is going to be working over time. Um, I just want to mention that all of these effects we're going to have to deal with them, and we'll discuss that in a later on uh, in a later on lecture. Okay, the next um, phenomena is called VT roll-off or the short channel effect. We often call it SCE. Um, I just want to mention most of the effects that I'm talking about here are short channel effects. They were not prevalent in long channel transistors. Um, all of them are called short channel effects, but this is the short channel effect also known as VT roll-off. So um, as channel length is reduced, effective channel length is reduced by the depletion region. So when we looked at our long channel, again, this is the source, this is the drain, and this is the gate, what we saw is this green line, and it was really nice. So the energy band of the source was low, the energy band of the gate was high, and the energy band of the drain was low, and we had this nice big uh, potential barrier where the electrons could not jump over um, and in fact, we had this long distance that we had to drive down the, um, the, 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 the energy band of the gate to get it to 0.2 electron volts, and that would actually be inver inverting our channel and allowing the electrons to jump over from the source to the drain. But what happened is, um, with scaling, we kept moving the, uh, the length. This is the length of the transistor, right? So we made it smaller and smaller and smaller, and at some point it got to this point of this blue line. And now um, the gate, which is trying to pull up the, uh, the energy over to here, uh, is fighting against the, the drain, which is pulling down the energy over here. And it actually, the potential barrier gets smaller, as you can see in this area. It doesn't get as high as before, and we need less energy to pull it down to 0.2 electron volts, or less voltage to pull it down. And if we go even smaller, we get to this red line over here, where literally our, um, uh, we have a much shorter distance. So in, a, in essence, what we're doing is we're making VT lower, because the distance that we have to push the green guy or the, 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 the gate uh, uh, potential down is the distance between that and the 0.2 uh, electron volts, which is uh, the point of inversion. Um, here, it becomes much smaller, and so we essentially made this VT uh, a lot lower. Okay, so what, what that says is that we have a dependence of VT on, on the channel length. Um, another way to look at this is looking at the uh, the gate as the, the channel as a trapezoid. So we have on the one hand the source and the drain, which are these PN junctions, and they have 
their um, their field that's uh, pushing over here in their depletion regions. On the other hand, we have the uh, field of the the gate of the gate that's uh, driving over here, and uh, they're kind of fighting against each other. So we can say that if half of this area is taken by the source in the drain and half is taken by uh, the gate, we get this nice trapezoid over here, where our channel is reduced to a trapezoid. And in a long channel device, this uh, kind of area at the fringe is really small. But as we make our channel smaller, um, this becomes a large larger amount of the channel, and it affects the amount of charge that we actually have. Uh, or it's a it's a more uh, relevant amount of charge that we have uh, stored inside here, and then we we need to deplete and add to uh, a reach inversion. Okay, so those are two ways of looking at this short channel effect. The final thing is that we get as designers is we see that when we take the the, the length of the transistor and make it smaller and smaller, um, what we see is that even though the threshold voltage should be constant for all lengths of transistors, it actually drops. It rolls off. So if we had a ball here and it was ro it was rolling along this line, it would fall. It rolled off. So that's our VT roll off. As, as we go to lower channel length, VT is reduced. Um, another uh, phenomenon that was actually shown on the previous slide, but I didn't um, relate to it, is called Dibble, Drain Induced, induced Barrier Lowering. Okay, so in short channels, the barrier of the channel is essentially lowered as the drain causes the energy band to drop closer to the source. So again, here we have our long channel device here in green, and when VDS is at zero volts, the energy is over here, and when we uh, we put a, a VDS equals VDD, it drops down to here. But again, we still have this nice large potential barrier over here, and we have to go all the way to our regular VT to um, uh, allow the uh, the transfer of electrons from side to side. But if we go to our short channel transistor, so here we have our short channel transistor over here, which already we see we're at the point where we're starting to have some VT roll off. But it gets even worse once we put the VDS equals VDD because we pull this band down much more. And now um, due to applying a VDS, uh, applying a, a voltage on, on the drain, we actually made the distance that we have to pull down the potential barrier shorter. So we caused VT to be reduced due to a, a drain um, voltage, which is not something that, again, should be affecting it, but it is. That we call, again, Dibble, drain-induced barrier lowering. So we're lowering the barrier, this barrier, due to um, uh, this, uh, 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 which we call it, this um, uh, voltage we're putting on the drain. Um, Okay, another way to look at this, I guess, is that I put voltage on my drain. That means my uh, depletion layer is getting larger. That means my channel is getting shorter. That's kind of another way of looking at it. Um, okay, in any case, what we see here is that as we make VDS larger, VT will go down. And that's something, again, that we can rewrite VT as the long channel VT minus some sort of a factor times uh, so the C depletion over the C ox. Okay, so we put VDS into um, the, the uh, expression for VT. Um, looking at uh, roll-off and dibble combined, again, what we have is our VT roll-off. As we go over here to the left, our VT drops. But um, when we look at dibble, it means that if we actually put a voltage on VDS, we get a small drop in VT even at VDD, but um, it gets lower and lower and drops even longer it drops even harder as uh, as we go to smaller channel lengths on the other hand there's also something called reverse short channel effect or rsc so if we said before that what we should have had here is the channel length as it got smaller we should have rolled off but if we actually take a, a mini modern devices what we'll see is that when we go lower all of a sudden vt gets uh, goes up higher and that's something very strange Okay, um, in fact, what we usually see is that it goes higher and then it goes and rolls off over here. That's called reverse short channel effect. It's caused by halo implants, which we'll um, learn about later on in the course. But that's another type of phenomenon that we have to be, uh, uh, be aware of. So those were many different phenomena that, that um, affect VT. So we should have had this VT that was this magic number provided to us by the fab. And uh, depending on how we um, built our device, that was going to be the VT. But we see that it's actually really affected 
by um, the bias and so forth. Num th that's number one. Number two, we saw that it's pretty complex and it, it has all kinds of strange uh, physical properties in there that may not be completely accurate, especially at these small nanoscale, uh, uh, at these nanoscale um, sizes. And we want to go and say what our VT is and give it some definitive definition. So we usually have to define a testing or a simulation framework to actually measure this. So how are we going to do it? Well, it turns out there are various ways to measure VT. There's not just one answer. One classic way is uh, to do this. We take a small VDS, so we set VDS equals 50 millivolt, that's pretty small VDS, and we sweep VGS. So this is VGS, and we plot this VGS versus ID curve. This is a curve that we all are very uh, familiar with. And if we look at our um, classic uh, type of a um, expression for the, uh, the, the, the current in the linear region, linear region is when VDS is very small. We have K VGS minus VT times VDS minus half VDS squared. Well, if we take 50 millivolts and square it, it becomes really small, and we can basically just um, throw away this expression, and then what we get is K times VGS minus VT times VDS. So we have a linear dependent, VDS was set, K is constant, so we have this um, linear dependence on VGS. Okay, and we can see that over here, as you see in this area, we have a linear uh, uh, slope. Okay, um, well, when when do we hit IDS equals zero, right? When is IDS equals zero? It would only be zero if VGS equals VT, right? At VGS equals VT, we'll get uh, IDS equals zero. So what we can do now is we can just take our line here, find out where in ter the uh, continuation of our slope over here hits zero and we can say that that is vt well yes that is vt well it's one definition of vt um, that we call this vt vtgm and it's gm because of the analog gm property of uh, the ratio between id and vgs okay so the point at where um, the slope the continuation of the slope crosses the zero point uh, the the zero uh, the um, zero value, the x-axis of this, uh, this plot, uh, this GM plot, will give us VTGM. But that's not the only way. In fact, it's not the very popular way. Uh, the more common way nowadays to find it is to say, okay, what is this VT? It's actually the point at where our transistor is off and we have a very small um, type of a current to the point where the transistor is on and we have a large current. What is a transistor on? Well, we can take some value. For example, um, 100 nanoamp times W over L, that seems like a nice value. Um, it can be different for different uh, um, process design kits, but that's kind of a, a value that's often taken. So we say that when um, we have a point uh, where IDS equals 100 nanoamp times W over L, that will be defined as VT. Okay, so again, we'll take VDS and we'll set it at 50 millivolts. We'll do this uh, VGS uh, to IDS sweep and we'll get our nice curve here. Now we'll look at where um, this point is, where uh, ID equals 0.1 microamp uh, times W over L. And what we see is we can run this thing here where it crosses the graph. We're going to define that as VT lin. Okay, again, this is different than VTGM. Uh, VTGM may have come out over here. Okay, so it's a different VT. Which one is more correct? That's a, a different question, and it's a, it's a question of what you're looking for. But that's the uh, VT under linear voltage. However, we said that there's the Dibble. Uh, Dibble basically changes VT. If we put a different VDS on, we're going to get a different VT, and that's going to be very relevant, especially because usually our transistors are going to either be uh, operated with zero or with uh, VDD in, digital, in the digital domain. So we also should check what happens when we put VDS equals VDD, and then we'll actually get a different curve, something like this, and then our uh, VT uh, will be over here. And that's when we're in saturation. Okay, so that we call VT saturation. So we'll ha set a high VDS, like VDS equals VDD, and then this will be called VT sat. Okay, so we got all these different parameters. Um, and I'm going to discuss how to simulate them, but just a, a, a small note, side note about simulation before I start because it's relevant. And uh, I'm not sure how many times you've actually been explained this. Um, the first step of all SPICE or SPECTRE or any type of uh, these types of simulators is actually running a DC operating point calculation. So um, what is that exactly? Um, we have our... our uh, 
our circuit and it can be all kinds of things it can have uh, resistors and it can maybe have uh, some sort of transistors and uh, who knows what but we have this circuit and we define all kinds of voltages this might be v1 and this might be v2 and this might be v3 and this might be some sort of r and so forth and um, what we want to do here is we want to actually find what our operating point of, uh, of this is what is the value uh, with whatever voltage we put over here and voltage we put over here what is the uh, what is going to be the value of v1 v2 what is going to be the current through here what's going to be the current through here the current here the current here etc uh, that is our operating point and um, how we do that is we actually make this set of equations where uh, we take the uh, con uh, the um, different parameters of the uh, of the uh, things here and we find our voltages and uh, we um, s solve a linear set of uh, equations it's actually done in a kind of a nonlinear fashion we have to uh, guess the answer and um, find the error and make this thing called convergence I'm not going to go deeply into the explanation of it but um, we find in the end what our values of all the voltages and the currents in the design are and, and that that is called our DC operating point or our DC op okay um, if we want a transient simulation we'd also start out with a DC operating point um, however in in that case we may have like um, if we have a capacitor or something like that the capacitor can have charge it can have an initial condition and we have to put that in and the initial condition will change with the um, the differential equation of the capacitor whereas in a DC operating point the capacitor will of course be uh, an open circuit the same thing um, we can have with a uh, an inductor okay um, and again in a, in a transient uh, simulation we can have these uh, voltage sources and so forth that may change a, a long time so what we'll do is we'll find the DC operating point at time zero then take a small time step um, and then find the difference that would have happened because of changes in the circuits if the, it's the different the differences in the capacitor or changes in these types of sources and so forth and that's how we make a transient so a transient simulation is basically just a very long um, collection of DC operating points same with the DC sweep if it was a DC sweep we'd find a DC operating point for example when we um, calculated like a VTC we had V in uh, to V out what we did is we looked at the operating point for v for a certain v in then change v in found the operating point changed it found the operating point we did all these simulations and then just connected them with the line and we got our vtc or something like that uh, an ac uh, simulation would also be we find our dc operating point and then put on our small signal models and uh, run an ac sweep so all of these specter simulations they have the dc operating point and an important point is that when we look at our um, transistor what we saw before is that different parameters for example vt of a transistor depend on the bias so the vt of the transistor depends on the vds well the vds depends on the operating point okay so um, there are two things we have the actual parameters of the transistor what its width is, its length is um, what the basic mobility of the uh, of, of the um, carriers inside are and so forth that they're defined by the technology but there are different things that are uh, affected by the operating point and they change so when we do a DC operating point we're gonna find what the actual parameters uh, the operating parameters of that device are currently in this specific operating point and that leads us so why am I telling you this because we have two um, simulation options they're called OP and MP inspector okay OP is operating point MP is model parameter okay um, so we saw for example that the threshold voltage is dependent on the operating point and I want to know what the VT of a transistor is in the given simulation okay so um, two things I'm gonna do first of all we had this VTF uh, VT0 VT0 is a, a given a constant uh, value that is provided by the technology it's not affected by uh, the operating point it's not affected by what my biases are to find that I'll use this MP uh, operation the model parameter so what I'm gonna do in virtuoso for example I will take my transistor I will um, I will write for example in the calculator in Viva I'll write something I'll hit the MP button then I'll go to the transistor I'll click on it and then it will give me this long long list of all the model parameters that come out from my spice model um, and my Beeson model and then I can click on one of them and in the calculator I'll have something like MP uh, slash VT0 uh, and then if uh, I'll hit enter, I'll get the actual value of VT0 of that. But all of these parameters are directly just read from 
the uh, spice model the um, uh, that is provided by the the, 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 the the PDK okay but that is again not the actual VT VT is going to be dependent on my biases and so forth and for that I use the OP or the operating point option and VT lin VT sat and VT GM are going to be uh, uh, are going to be coming out of uh, the operating point. So I'm going to run a DC operating point simulation. I'm going to find my operating point. Then I'm going to uh, hit the OP button in uh, in Viva, go over, click on my transistor, and uh, now I'm going to get a list not of the um, not of the model parameters, but of the operating point parameters. And there are going to be lots of interesting things that, that we know of. So there's of course going to be these three: VT Lin, VT Sat and VTGM, but there are also going to be things that we always talk about like VDS or VGS or even different things like the capacitance. We can have the capacitor here that's going to be um, CGD or something like that. That's also going to be, uh, remember, the capacitance is, uh, is dependent on the operating point as well. Okay, so those two options are going to really help us find different uh, parameters that are going to affect our simulation. So that's just something that I wanted to um, and discuss. Um, just the last point about that, we discussed roll off uh, SCE and RSE reverse short channel effects. So how would I go about now uh, knowing what MP and OP are? How would I go about um, running such a simulation? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a um, uh, in, an operating point um, with a parametric change of the length and then I'm going to um, uh, uh, ask for this uh, OP of something like VT uh, lin, for example, I could do it with VT lin, um, across all of these different changes of uh, running L equals, I don't know, um, 65 nanometers with uh, 5 nanometer changes uh, until something like 150, or what, let's say 1 micron, or something like that. And then I could plot this, and I would get my L over here, and I would get my VT lin over here, and what I would see is that it's going to go like this. Probably over here I'll have this rise for RSC and then this drop off for roll off. So that's the type of simulation that I can run. Okay, to end this chapter, I wanted to talk about the Computer Hall of Fame for, um, for this lecture. And in this time, we're going to um, discuss a, a computer called the ACE. Well, we generally consider the ENIAC to be the first computer, but actually the full, first fully electronic computer was the ACE. This was the Atensoft Berry computer that was conceived in 1937 and found operational in 1942. It was built at, Ohio, at Iowa State University by Professor John Atensoft and his student Clifford Berry, and that's why it's called the Atensoft Berry computer. Okay. Um, now, why uh, do we often consider the ENIAC to be the first computer and not the ACE? Because actually, this is not programmable or Turing complete, which the ENIAC holds the uh, still the title of being the first. Uh, computer that was both of those. Uh, but it still did, was a computer and it included binary arithmetic and electronic switching elements, which means it is the actual first electronic computer. And therefore, there is a big patent dispute that went on for uh, many, many years. Um, and finally, in 1973, the patent of the ENIAC was invalidated and the ACE is considered the first uh, computer to uh, have uh, existed.